Joining us now, Pat Buchanan, one of my absolute favorites, former uh, advisor to, I don't know, 17 presidents. I don't know how many like in the end. <laughs> the end. Hey, Pat, how are you? I'm doing just fine. How are you this morning? I'm, uh, I'm good. Not surprised by this uh, court ruling. I went back, Pat, and I was listening to old interviews that Judge Bork did on his book, Slouching Toward Gomorrah. And his his discussion back in 1996 of why it was incumbent Hello? upon the legislative branch to actually uh, circumscribe the jurisdiction of the federal courts. Well, I just somehow I didn't hear your question. Oh, okay. I was just. Point. I was but just, there's no doubt about it. Yeah. If you're talking about the what's called the Stripper Amendment, the Article Three, Section Two of the Constitution gives Congress and the President. Uh, the power to restrict the jurisdiction of the federal courts. And what we have here, basically, is an assertion by the 11th Circuit and by that one judge out in Washington that the national security decisions on borders of the President of the United States advancing the national security of the United States are subject to veto by single federal district judges. Now, this is an assertion of power over presidential policy that cannot be allowed to stand. What would you recommend, uh, an understanding the dynamic as it exists today, what would you recommend that the president's well, team do here? The, that they should rewrite the order. Uh, I think, I really think they ought to go up to the Supreme Court on this. Mm-hmm. And the reason is, let's find out if the Supreme Court is going to assert uh, superior authority over the, over the national security decisions of the White House and the President of the United States by federal courts, so that, in other words, they become the dominant power. I mean, who was it, Lincoln, who ever said the one who decides uh, what the law says, he's the lawgiver. Mm-hmm. Well, and I think that uh, this is something that uh, Judge Bork understood, you know, 30, 40 years ago about what was happening to the federal courts. They were becoming uh, like like the law faculties of universities and colleges because they came out of those law faculties, and they were seeking the approval and the imprimatur, not of what our framers understood the meaning of the Constitution to be, but they were seeking the approval of the editorial boards of major U.S. newspapers. Uh, and the problem really lies, though, the problem really lies with the executive branch and with the, especially with the congressional branch, that will not stand up to the U.S. Supreme Court, that will, it will not stand up to court decisions, won't restrict their jurisdiction. Let me tell you a story. It's in my upcoming book. I was in a meeting with Nixon and Connolly back in, uh, I think it was November of 1971, where the Supreme Court heard a case on whether Nixon could set off a five-megaton explosion in Amchitka to test his, uh, his SDI. And the court ruled that he could. But Nixon told Connolly that if the court had ruled the other way, he would have set the bomb off. Now, in, in other words, mm-hmm. at some point, an executive has got to defy the judges on these matters. As I've got in my column this morning, you know, Jefferson not only refused to enforce the Alien and Sedition Acts, his party impeached Samuel Chase, yep. who had conducted one of the trials. These people acted. I mean, <clears throat> Lincoln was about to arrest the Chief Justice of the United States, who said he didn't have the power to suspend habeas corpus. So you're going to have to have strong presidents. Or, frankly, you cannot rely upon the Congress. It is a cowardly right. institution. It simply will not protect its own rights. It surrenders its control over the currency. I mean, uh, the president, I mean, the, the, its power to declare war has been surrendered to the president. It really doesn't want responsibility. No, which is why we still don't have a replacement for Obamacare. I mean, they don't, you know, they don't, they don't, they don't want, they don't want that on their shoulders. Sure, they don't want to make a decision where they go home and half the half of the folks are saying we're going to throw you out. So this is what they're they're interested in self preservation. I guess said the bottom line as are we all. <laughs> yeah, getting getting reelected. Well, again, it, it sure. goes it goes back to the desire to be loved and to retain power not the desire to do what is right and a good friend of mine who's a very prominent uh, attorney in Washington really brilliant he when when this when this Seattle district court uh, stay was put in place and the ruling was uh, against Trump he said to me Trump should say make us 
that he should order Homeland Security to continue the ban in place. Yeah. That And everyone's like, that would be a constitutional right. crisis. We already have a constitutional that, crisis. That, it, well, that's what you want. It's I don't say it's not a constitutional right. Your friend is exactly right. You have to, at some point, defy them. Let me give you one other example. When Mitt Romney, the Massachusetts Supreme Court, the first one, voted 4-3, declared homosexual, I mean, gay marriages to be legitimate marriages and ordered the state to hand out marriage licenses. I urged Governor Romney, just say, I've read the Constitution again. It's not in there. I'm not going to do it. The state the legislature and I are going to pass the law saying your ruling does not stand. Defy the court. Well, and I think because there's been no will to do that, the courts have taken more and more power of well, they and don't. it's a natural inclination. They put on those robes, and all of a sudden, they rule our lives. I mean, my, what was my friend down there, Quirk, uh, a law professor, he wrote about the book on judicial dictatorship. I mean, it was an excellent book, and he argued his whole life for the stripper amendment, as he called it. Article 3, Section 2, just restrict the review jurisdiction of the federal courts and the Supreme Court, which is right there. Congress has the power right there in Article 3. Well, I think it's it, it, this 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 was in order a couple of decades ago at least, uh, and I mean I think well, it began with frankly it began with Brown. Yeah, it it, it Brown be- was a very very popular decision, but it began with Brown. Well, and, and which that overturned an 1896 decision. Right, and that I think gave a lot of judges the understanding that. Uh, you know, if you get the accolades from the academy and from the media, sure. <clears throat> then you're doing the right thing. And and sure. And then they, the court then proceeded. Look, they said uh, the establishment clause says that you know we have to purge all replicas, prayers, uh, any kinds of even pledges of allegiance and things like that uh, from the educational system of the country. And they asserted this authority. Then they said, look, the all state legislatures have to be on population alone. And so they kept making all these decisions to remake America. And the court and the Congress of the United States simply accepted it. As did presidents. Excuse me, I heard Nixon say on some of these busing decisions, you know, I just said, look, don't cut off the funds. Send Mm -hmm. the funds to the school districts. And President Nixon said, as I point out in this book, we can't defy the court. We can't. Uh, we can't defy the court again. Like it's an imperial judiciary. Like, that. so is there anything the court can do? I mean, I think w- w- we saw. Well, the, you have to. Defy it. It'll keep doing it until it's slapped down. Look at FDR had the same problem. <clears throat> Excuse me, but he had the problem. They were they were declaring his New Deal ideas unconstitutional. So he decided he's going to pack it. And the court had great prestige, and he's going to add. One justice for every justice on the Supreme Court, I think, who was over 70. Right. And he was going to add up to six justices. And he did it in 1937. And it was a huge firestorm that broke his coalition. And he lost, uh, I think, 72 seats in the House in 38. So it didn't work there. And presidents have forever been apprehensive about defying the court because they're not sure they'll win in the court of public opinion. I think a lot of this goes back to something that I know, Pat, you've written about so eloquently over the years, which is this belief that – and I know we're jumping from the law for a moment – but in in multiculturalism, that all – you know, all ways of thinking are equally as good, that all cultures – and I'm talking about our – our belief in uh, the rule of law and sure. obviously coming from British common law and so forth. I want to play a soundbite again from this 96 Bork interview. Let's listen. Multiculturalism is a theory that all cultures are, are equal. And, and of course, there is a, uh, in the schools, there's been an effort to prevent people from assimilating to the dominant American culture and to retain uh, separate cultures, Hispanic or whatever, uh, or black and so forth. Um, it is not true that all cultures are equal. They may be entitled to respect, but we're talking about prepar- uh, preparation for success in a complicated society like ours, all cultures are not equal. Uh, and yet, you know, that's what kids, it's beaten into kids' head today. That, that, it, no, the way you're thinking about a representative democracy, no, 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 you have to, do, you, it has to be outcome-based judging. You have to get to the outcome regardless of how you get, you have to get to that outcome. It's outcome-based judging. And that's what other countries do. And that's what we have to do. Well, there's no, what Bork says is correct, but... And all, all cultures are simply not equal, 
in the United States or the West. Ours is, of course, rooted in the Judeo-Christian tradition. It goes back to the 2,000 years at least. It produced Western Europe. It produced the United States of America. It was basically provided the basis of morality and law and all the rest of it. They weren't all equal. And the idea that they are, and this is, that Bork is exactly right, there's an idea of equality which is simply, I mean, you can say, People have to be have certain rights uh, that cannot be taken away from them because of their religion. But the idea that all are equal is an absurdity. And egalitarianism. Frankly, if you're a Christian, do you believe that Christ was the Son of God? No other religion claims that. Uh, Pat, uh, the Gorsuch comments to uh, a Democrat uh, senator, Dick Blumenthal, and also apparently to Ben Sass. Um, calling Trump's comments disheartening and disillusioning, uh, demoralizing, whatever. Uh, you know, we can quibble with whether he said it about Trump. Or, I mean, it, it seems to me he said it about well, Trump's me, comments. On that, Come on. I think Gorsuch's comments were disheartening <laughs> and, and uh, dismaying, I'll say. I mean, why did he do that? I mean, what Trump said was, look, he got a so-called judge. So what? Big deal. I think that... Gorsuch should not have taken that shot at the man who appointed him or went on the line for him. And frankly, it suggests, uh, to me, it suggests an effort by Mr. Judge Gorsuch to get along with the people that hold his face Concerning. in his hand. It concerns me greatly, because there's another person that we know that likes to get <laughs> along, and his name is Anthony M. Kennedy. Exactly. You want, they want to be popular. They want to be popular. I think, with due respect to John Roberts, I think... John Roberts on that decision on Obamacare oh, God. did want, did not want to be really one of the front four in the Scalia court. He wanted it to be the uh, Roberts court, and so that's why he took that independent stand in his mind. Well, I, I th think that's one of the motives. I think that uh, whoever gave the green light to Gorsuch in that White House counsel's office to go ahead and put daylight between him and Trump, that person shouldn't be working. Do you think uh, someone did that in the yes. in the, in the, in the Hundred percent. Oh my goodness! Yep. Said it was okay to do well, that because it'll friends, make you, you look know, independent, Pat. Because it, it'll make him look independent. In other words, okay, you want to? Uh, yeah, we get it. That that'll actually be good. It's, Just stupid you're strategy. Letting score, you're letting the guy score off your own president. Dumb. To show his independence. Dumb, dumb, <laughs> dumb, dumb. D it's dumber than dirt. I, I don't. I don't even. I mean, look. I'm not in there. I know it's easier you know, when you're on the outside, but it's just the. I mean, I talked to a couple appellate court judges about this over the last three or four days. They're like, that's one of the most horrifying things. I can't even imagine saying something. You just, the question, the question's asked, well, what do you think about Trump? You, the, you say, I don't think it's appropriate for me to discuss what the chief exactly. executive says on political matters. I'm a man of strong opinions, and I'm delighted he appointed me. Exactly. Was, what, are, what are your questions about the law, et cetera? Well, I, another friend of mine said, <laughs> he emailed me and said, I'd pull the nomination, put Pryor in there. Let's just pull the you nomination. Know, We're done. I hate to say it. That was exactly my <laughs> thought last night. I said, Gorsuch out, bring Pryor in from the bullpen. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go. Now we're cooking with gas. Now the, now we're now we're gonna get the real jurist in there. This was just a warm up act. Oh no, my God. That's why. I, yeah, that's why I'm not in there. Uh, no, but uh, Pat, we loved your piece. It is so important for people to understand. It's time to hold the courts accountable, and that means you can circumscribe their jurisdiction. Pat, you're just brilliant. We love you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you, my friend. You take it. Easy. All right, you too. Be sure to not shop, don't shop at Nordstrom. Uh, no. <laughs> We didn't get into that either. Oh, my God. All right, Pat, we appreciate it. I'm not a big Nordstrom's fan anyway. <laughs>